to the point where it actually makes a difference in the game. Where, like, it's like, oh my god. Dude, today I walked into the game. Um, so, I'm, I'm sorry I was a little late in putting the homeworks up. I did put them up. Uh, let me know if it's a problem. It is a problem. Yeah. Uh, I even put next week, so, but I may change next week. Um, so anyway, they're there now, so you can do them. And I'm sorry I didn't do it until yesterday. What? We can postpone the deadline. Uh, we can postpone the deadline if you want, but I can't make the other one. Uh, just later, you know what I mean? Okay. Let me know if it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. Huh. 
No, I guess I did. Okay. 2x e to the y, 0. The derivative of this guy with respect to x, y, and z. The derivative of this guy with respect to x, y, and z gives me 1. Uh, with respect to y, I get sine of z. With respect to z, I get y cosine z. And then here I get 1, 1, and 0. And so at the point, so here we see that f of 1, 1 pi is uh, uh, I'll write it, I guess I'll write everything as columns, so I don't know why. 1, 1 pi is 1 plus e, 1 sine of pi is 0, and 2. And so here, the derivative of this function at 1, 1 pi is 2 e 0 1 0 uh, minus four, right cosine of pi is minus 1 um, 1 1 0 right so this is the this is the linear map that approximates f at the point or near the point 1 1 pi um, and so, and you can check if you want that the gradient, <coughs> the gradient of this at this point is 2 e 0, the gradient of this at this point is 1, 0 minus 1, the gradient of this at this point is 1, 1, 0, so everything's good. Um, <coughs> yeah. And, okay, so that's just to remind you how all this stuff works. Any questions about that stuff? Everybody's good with that? Right? I'm just sort of re resetting the stage. Okay, and then where I left off, right at the end of the class, I talked about the tangent approximation. So, I guess maybe I'm putting an F there. So, if I have this same function F, then I really want. X naught. So the tangent approximation to F, which is sort of the first term of the Taylor series, is just going to be evaluate your function at some point, and then we add on the derivative matrix <coughs> evaluated at that point times, let's make that there. This is a vector. Or I think of this as a column vector. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Right? So this is just saying to me <coughs> near x naught f of x, not f of x naught, f of x is close to that. So this is good approximation or somewhat good approximation or f of x. So this is exactly like what you see in one variable calculus. This is the tangent line approximation, except it's not a line, it's a point. Right? So using the same example, if I wanted to estimate Somehow my f changed from a lowercase to an uppercase in my notes, but I guess I'll leave this lower. So if I want to estimate, say, f of 1.1 1 .1, um, 0.9 pi plus 0.01, then I can just use this. Yeah? Can you say tangent point when we have f of x, y, z? It's not really a two-dimensional tangent. tangent. Let me just say tangent. Yes, it's the. So technically, set plane two for x, y, z is. It's a hyperplane, right? Right. I mean, it's yeah, it's a hyperplane. Right. Here I have three, so this has to be. It's the tangent space. Um. 
I just lost my place. Okay, so say I want to approximate this. Well, this is going to be just about f of 1, 1 pi, which is right there, plus this matrix 2e0, 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 1, 0, times the column vector, which is the difference between this and this. So that'll be 0.1 in the x coordinate minus 0.1 in the y coordinate and 0.01 in the z coordinate, which is, uh, I lost it, it was there somewhere, 1 plus e, 1, 2, plus, and then here we get 0.2 minus 0.1e and a 0. Uh, let me write these as factors. So that's the change in x. The change in y will be 0.1 minus 0.01. And the change in z will be 0. It will be 0.1 minus 0.1 plus 0. So that means this will be uh, 1.2 plus e over 10. No, sorry. 0.9e. That's from this. And here I get that's uh, 0.09. And this is uh, at 0, 2. So if I, since I did this before, this is, well, I guess it's just about 3.646, 2. So this is sort of a stupid example because I have to do the E stuff to approximate E. Uh, if I if I just and if I am approximating e on a calculator, then I can certainly just compute directly the value which I did in my office, and I got uh, three point six six nine. Um, and then in this I got 1.09, So it's pretty good. This little screw here, but uh, so I guess that's just right. So again, this is just the same stuff that you did in one variable calculus, where you want to approximate, you know, the cosine of 0.3. 0.1 by looking at the derivative, looking at the value of the cosine at 0, plus 0.1 times the derivative. Exactly the same, except here we're moving using the tangent approximation. Okay? Um, maybe, let me do one more example. And, and this example is in the book, except not really, because they say it's something that it isn't. So, let's so if we take, say, g of u v, so this is going to take in. Uh, no, actually, I want to take one something away from zero. Well, let me write it down. So, uh, which do I use, cosine or sine? U cosine V, U sine V, V. Um, so the book claims, the book does the example with a U here, and then claims it's what I'm going to draw, but it's actually not. It's a cone if you put a U here. Uh, but it says that it's, it's a, a ramp which is just wrong, but it does everything else right, so it doesn't matter. 
Um, so, so this is something that will take, say, what do I want? Uh, well, if I just take a, a box like that in the U V plane, and I map it into X Y Z space, then for a fixed value of U, I get a line with a line pointing at the origin, and for I'm sorry, for fixed values of U, I get something that spirals up. I get helixes, right? For fixed values of U, if I'm going to fix U, then I'll get helical things going up. And then for fixed values of V, I get lines. Yeah? So what I get is a ramp-like structure. I think I did this before. Can you even see what I drew? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I get a spiraling up thing like that. Now it has a problem at zero because, well, at zero it stretches way out. But other than that, we're okay. So I get this ramp-like structure. And so now let's look at what df dg tells us. So let's just compute dg. So dg will just be the well, I have two variables in and three variables out. So I'm going to get a 2 by 3 matrix, or 3 by 2. I just forget who's, who's a row and who's a column. But anyway, I get the 3 by 2 matrix. Right? So if I take the partial of u cosine v with respect to u, I get the cosine of v. If I take the partial with respect to v, I get u Maybe a little more space. Negative u sine v. If I take the partial of u sine v with respect to u, I get the sine of v. And what am I doing wrong? No, it's okay. And uh, with respect to u, I get u cosine v. Not cos. Cos v. And if I take the rest of the, I get a 0 and a 1. Right? So I get that 3 by 2 matrix. And let's say at the point to be, I don't know, 2 pi over 2, which is the image of, which will be sort of here somewhere. Right? Make a, a quarter turn. Then let's let's see what we get. So dg of two pi over two will be the three by two matrix. So the cosine of pi over two is zero. The uh, sine of pi over two is is one, so I get minus two. The sine of pi over two is one, so I get one. The cosine of pi over two is zero again. And I get 0, 1 there. Right? So I should get that matrix. And now what is that telling me? Well, certainly I can do the same business here where I can think about this as an approximation. But I maybe want to interpret this slightly differently. Um, if I multiply this, well, no, let's... Okay, so now let's think about what this, how I can see the tangent plane from this. Right, so, so here, if I'm looking at the image of the point 2 pi over 2, so g of 2 pi over 2 is the point x is, uh-oh, where's my map? x is 0 y is 2 and z is 2. So near two, 0 to 2, I want to claim, so near 
0 to 2, my tangent plane, did I make a mistake? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> Um, my tangent plane, what does it look like? Well, let's think of it as being attached here at the point 0 to pi over 2. So it looks like, I mean, I'm at the point 0 to pi over 2. And then these columns tell me the parametric representation of the tangent plane. So it's going to be 0, 1, 0 times some vector in the x direction. Uh, let's call that t. Well, if I move in the u, if I move u, then I increase, let me, well, let me just call it t for a minute. And negative 2, 0, 1 in the v. Right? So this is saying go to the point 0, 2, 0, and in one direction, this t, this means increase u by t. And this is increase v, well, I shouldn't have used v, uh, s, by s. It's just the same statement, just interpreted in a different way. This is telling me that near the point 0, 2, 0, I have a tangent plane which contains one vector that only points in the y direction, and that is the image of the u-axis. If I increase u and hold, hold y fixed, then I move this way in the y direction. Right? So imagine there's z, that's z, here's y, and here's x. So if I increase here, if I increase in this direction, I move in this line, which is parallel to the y, and exactly at the rate in which I increased it. And if I increase in the other direction, here, then I get a vector which moves, why is it anyway? Something's wrong. Wait, isn't your, isn't your initial graph? Um, zero, two, pi over two. No, my my initial graph goes to like three pi. But so your your the point that you marked in the initial graph yeah. doesn't look like zero, two, zero. The zero in the x is not. Oh, sorry, it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why did I want that to be positive? Oh no, no, that's right. So if I move a little bit in the u direction. I mean, in fixing u and moving in the v direction, what happens to the x? Well, it three decreases a lot, but the z increases. So this is a this is a vector pointing up. Right? So I can see this tangent plane sitting there. I don't I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. It's tilted up so that the x decreases by a factor of minus 2. And as the x decreases by a factor of minus 2, the y doesn't change. And the z increases by a factor of s, however much I move the other guy. <coughs> and just, you know, if I did this at another point, which was turned a little further, you can see you get some combination of these things turning a little, a little more. Is this clear to everybody? Am I beating dead horses? I'm not sure. Okay, so I was talking to some to another professor who was telling me that you know she can't always read 
people's faces, I usually think it's okay, but you know, if she doesn't know, when she says something, people just sort of look, and she doesn't know if she's going too slow, and so they're all just like, yeah, whatever, get on with it, <laughs> and she's going too fast, and they're like, whatever the hell you're talking about, just <laughs> hurry up and get to something I understand. And right now, I thought, yeah, I don't understand that, but right now, that's what I'm seeing, it's like, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to assume, unless somebody tells me, that it's the, yeah, whatever, get on with it. Yeah. So, so that's the tangent plane. Yeah. At that point, the gradient, does it follow the spiral up, or we don't No. We know something. That's what I want to talk about next. Okay, sorry. So, no, it's perfect. Great lead in. <laughs> what about the gradient? Well, here, see, I don't really have a gradient. I have several gradients. <laughs> Because this is not a function. This is a function from R2 to R3. So there's two gradients. Because there are, or there's three gradients. I, I have multiple functions involved. The gradient only works for a function into R. Right? A function where I put in a bunch of numbers and out comes one number. Here I'm putting in two numbers and out comes three numbers. The gradient is here, there's actually three gradients. There's the gradient of that function, the gradient of that function, and the gradient of that function. And those correspond here, here, and here. There are three gradient vectors laying around here. There is the vector 0 minus 2, there is the vector 1, 0, and there is the vector 0, 1. Exactly what those mean, I want to put off for just a few minutes. But there are three gradient vectors here. But then there are sort of three ta two tangent vectors, which give me the tangent plane that I can interpret in this way. So depending on how I want to look at this matrix, whether I want to pay attention to the columns or the rows, tell me whether I'm looking at gradients or whether I'm looking at tangent vectors. It's a little harder in the case of this 3 by 3 matrix. The tangent vectors are there, but they're three-dimensional, so it's a little harder to see something tangent to a surface, because they don't really have a surface. It's a space that is being deformed. Okay? So I'll say more about gradient vectors and stuff real soon. Are we okay with all this? So now I'm going to start new stuff. So this was review, although really I kind of stopped about here. So it's review of what I didn't talk about, <laughs> as opposed to review of what I did. Well, well. OK. So for a few minutes, no, maybe not yet. So now I want to specialize, once again, to a, a specific class of functions. Suppose that my input and my output spaces are of the same size. So I have a function from Rn to Rn. <coughs> so I can think of that, well, and, and I'm going to mostly think of it as n is 2 or maybe n is 3. So one way, and let's see, I have an example function that I was dragging around, 2xy over 2. And let me just use a capital F for a while. So F of xy is 2xy over 2. So one way we can think of this, and this is the way that we've been thinking about this so far, is I put in a box. I apply F to it. And out comes some shape. In this case, since I'm doubling the x coordinate, this box will get twice as long. And I'm having the y coordinate, so this box will get skinnier. This output will be something that looks like that. Right? It'll just take this box, it'll squish it in the y direction, because the y goes to y over 2, and it'll stretch it in the x direction. I can do things more complicated where I'm going to mix up the x's and the y's and all sorts of stuff, but maybe this is enough because it's easy to see what that function does. So this is one way to think of 
a function of two variables. But another way that is very useful, and this is in fact a linear function of two variables, because I can quote a linear function. Uh, but another way that we can think of a, a function from Rn to Rn, which somebody asked me when I first did it in you, right? Said, well, isn't that a vector field? So yes, now I want to tell you what a vector field is. So I can also, so this is one way. I can think of this as a mapping, which takes in some, some domain and does stuff to it, and I get something out. But another way that I can think of this, at least in the case where and the input and the output are the same dimension, is I can think of this <coughs> as a vector field. Now here, what this means is rather than drawing a picture of the input space and a picture of the output space, what I want to do is to each point x, y, I want to attach a vector or an arrow f of x, y. Now this concept works no matter what dimension I'm in, whether I'm in one dimension or eight dimensions, but I'm going to draw it in two because two is easiest to draw. Now, so that means that really, in terms of the transformation, I am not connecting, I'm not thinking of take this box, lay it over this box, and then draw an input from the source point to the output point. Instead, I'm thinking of this F as sort of giving me an infinitesimal, infinitesimal motion of each point. So here, like along the x-axis, again, let's just use the same f of x, y is 2x, y over 2. So along the x-axis, well, at the 0, 0, there's a 0 vector attached. That's pretty boring. But as I move along the x-axis, say at the point 1, I attach a vector from point 2, and it points outward. At the point negative 1, I attach a vector of length negative 2, it points outward. At 1 half, well, it's too long, I attach a vector of size 1, and so on. So as I move out here, these vectors get bigger and bigger, and they point away from 0. And similarly, along the y-axis, I attach vectors which get bigger and bigger, but they don't get as big as, as fast in the x, so they're a little shorter. so on. And then because of the nice fact that this is a linear, a linear function, these vectors are very simple and they're just a combination here. So out here at a point like, well let's do 1, 1. At a point 1, 1, the vector that I attach is the vector 2, 1 half. So that'll be something like that. And in general, I would get a bunch of vectors and as I move further in the x direction and moving up, they sort of fall over and point more in the x. So I did something like that. Okay? Now really, in this case, this vector field is describing the derivative of some function. But, so this is a different object than this, but I want to eventually try to relate these things. These vector fields are very important in differential equations and modeling things, but we'll come back to that when we get to it. We're not mostly operating on vector stuff, but a lot of this course, we will come back to vector fields a lot because they are an important part of what we're dealing with.
And I guess, well, okay, so let me just say this for now. You can imagine I can find a curve. This is not what we're going to focus on. We'll focus on this in a little while. If I have some initial point, I can find a curve to which all of these vectors are tangent. And this is something that one often does and you want to do where the vector field describes something about a function from, well, uh, describes something about a curve. This is solving a differential equation. This is also called integrating the, the vector field. Where we want to find a curve where the vector field that is described here describes all the tangents to that. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about general vector fields now, but the concept of general vector field is sort of there. How many people have seen vector fields before? Who hasn't seen a vector field before? Okay, so we'll talk about that. Now. And in particular, I want to talk about a special vector field, which is a gradient vector field. So here, I'm going to think of, I'm going to start with some function f from rn, and n will be 2, in r. And then if I take the gradient of f, If, if I look at, so, so in, this, in this example, f of x, y is x squared plus get y, y squared plus 4. So we know this defines for us a surface, right? So in, in this case, n is 2, but in general, for, for any number of variables. So the graph of f of x, y will be a paraboloid, but elliptical. It will be elongated in the x direction and shorter in the y direction. So I'll get sort of a parabolic thing.
and it's kind of a derivative thing. Are we okay with this? All right, so I have that. And there should be some very clear relationship between this and this. And I want to sort of work out what that relationship is. Is it clear what it is? I mean, if I put, of course, these are on different scales and they look terrible, but if I put this on top of this, notice that the arrows along the x-axis, well, if I could draw, the arrows along the x-axis point that way. Yeah? The curve of the level curves are orthogonal to the Yes, exactly. So, so the thing that may be this um, that this, this picture should have, so in this example, and it's true in general, the level curves <coughs> are orthogonal to the gradient. So the gradient perpendicular to the level curves. The gradient vector, so in other words, if I can write it as a theorem, I'll work out all of that stuff. So suppose, let's see what hypothesis is. I have F taking Rn to R, differentiable on some open set U. So it has some domain. And then for each vector x given domain that has a gradient which is not a zero vector, because if it's the zero vector, I can't, I mean, it's still orthogonal, but I want to interpret something here. So for each guy in there, then the gradient of f at that point points in the direction of maximal increase. Want, you can just say differentiable near x. Yeah. And then for each x, each appropriate x. I mean, you can take the derivative around x. Then you have a tangent plane there, and this gradient points where the tangent plane goes up the most. And furthermore, length of the gradient vector at that point is, is the slope in the direction. In other words, it's the direction of the derivative there. It's the amount of the increase by a unit. Yes. And I have garbage. So, you know, well, okay. So, all right, so let's prove that. So, how would I prove that? You know. 
Um, so suppose, so I want to use what I said last time, so let, do we have a question or a comment? Yeah. Are you, are you asking us? Yeah, sure, tell me. Okay, so um, I'd say you can take the thing of so you do measure for talent? Sure. Uh, well, you can prove that it always points in the opposite direction of the normal line, and the normal line points in the direction of the lowest increase, so the greatest direction of increase. How do I prove that it points in the opposite direction of the normal? Because uh, if you think about uh, the function of the tangent thing created by it, it's uh, f of x, or it's f of x times x plus f of y times y plus z times, uh, so, like, something like that, you know? So the normal line to um, the tangent line at that point is always going to be f of x, f of y, uh, or f taking the f, derivative of f taking the x direction, derivative of f taking the y direction, one, and then, um, or however many dimensions you're in. And then um, the gradient looks really, um, takes uh, the x and y part of that, and is in the, or for a two dimensional case, would be f of x and f of y, so it's pointing in uh, the opposite direction because the, the normal line is f of x, or f in the x, f in the y, and the negative one, and uh -huh. then the opposite direction of that is just going to be f of x, f in the x, f in the y direction, and then since that's always pointing in the direction of the lowest increase, that means that the gradient vector will always be pointing in the direction of the greatest increase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's do it a different way. That's the same. <laughs> it's exactly the same way. It's actually what you said. But so I'm going to do it in some way that looks different, but is in fact exactly the same. So I'm going to let u be a unit vector. So I don't know if people understood what he said. But what he said was not wrong. He was right. He was saying you look at the tangent plane, you write the equation for the tangent plane, and you forget about the z component of the tangent plane, and you see that the tangent plane corresponds to the gradient and then stuck up in the z component. And then you just project that and you see it goes the other way, so everything's cool. That's essentially what he just said. And this is almost exactly the same, except it isn't. Okay, so I take any unit vector, and let's com compute the directional, uh, let's compute df du. So I'm going to take the directional derivative of f in the direction of this unit vector. So this is at some point. So just pick any old direction that you want to go in and take a unit vector that points in this. And we saw before that that is the gradient evaluated at x dotted with u. I don't know if you remember that, but when we were calculating directional derivatives, this is the formula we came up with. You want to take the derivative in the u direction, that's what it is. So now this will have its maximum. Well, it's a dot product. So I have some gradient vector here, and I have some unit vector u here, and I'm taking the dot product, which gives me the piece in the u direction. Well, this will be the biggest when they're parallel. Okay. So Um, so that means that u is pointing now in the direction of maximal increase.
And, and also, if we take u, uh, u is parallel to the gradient of f, then, so that means, well, let's not take parallel. So let's say that, so theta is the angle between, I don't think I'm writing here. If theta is the angle between u and gradient f, then gradient f dotted with u is length of gradient f, length of u, cosine of the angle between them. But if we are in, if, if u is parallel to the gradient of f, then cosine of theta is 1. And so the, the, the factor here, so the increase factor, the length of is the length of the gradient. And also, you can see that if they are pointing in opposite directions, so also, if u is opposite to the gradient of f, then this is the maximal is the direction of the maximal decrease, since here theta is negative. So in some sense there's nothing going on here. But in some sense, there's a lot going on, right? The proof is like, take the derivative, duh, okay, there it is. But, okay, so I did that. So, so in particular, that, that tells us that these arrows are orthogonal, well, I'll come back to that, but they point in the way that the surface, the, the steepest way up, right? If I look at this surface here, and I take some point, here, then the gradient is going to point the steepest way up. That was supposed to be the steepest. It's hard to see that it's the steepest. It points up the most. Yeah? What if there's a bunch of good options for what the steepest is? Then the function didn't happen to be differential. No, no, like maybe it, like, uh, it has a scoop. You know, the, yeah, uh, two directions that are the greatest increase. The then it wasn't differential because you would have two two tangent points pointing in opposite <coughs> ways. I'm mean, at a single point, right? So if at a single point, so you like the bottom of, of exactly that parabola. Is right, the bottom of exactly this parabola. There isn't. There's infinitely many steepest way ups. Notice that I said um, if it's non-zero then we can do this. If it's zero, there is no unique steepest way up. Also, if there is no gradient, then maybe there's multiple steepest way ups. So here there are two, right? At the bottom here, there's exactly two. There's this way and this way, and they're both best. If I take, instead of this function, I take, let's call it, I don't know, P of x, y is x squared plus y squared, then at 0, the gradient of f is 0, and every direction is the best way up, because it's round. So all directions are best. <coughs> but once I get away from 0, there's a unique way. If you think about, you know, the fact there's, you know, there's that I don't know if it's a riddle, you know, the thing where the guy, you know, well, okay, forget the story. You, it, at the North Pole, all directions are south. You can't go every, any, if you're standing at the North Pole, no matter which way you move, it's south. There is no unique north, there is no east or west at the North Pole, because all ways are the way of maximal increase in south. So there's a similar statement here. 
because the, the gradient is zero. In, in this okay. uh, so it's very important that we have a non-zero gradient vector, otherwise we might have multiple waves that are steepest. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to uh, use this now. to talk about some kind of a chain rule. So part of our goal, which I won't get to today, but I should get to next time, maybe I'll get to today, is to do the general chain rule. But let's do a chain rule in kind of a stupid case. Let me do it by an example. Suppose that I have some function, let me draw it by a picture. F taking R to Rn, and in fact, in my example, I'll even draw 3. And then I have some other function, G, taking R3 back to R. So here in my example, F of T, so this is some curve into space, so you can imagine that this is like a path. Well, this is a path you're going to follow is, say, t, t squared, t cubed. So this gives me some path in space. And we can imagine g is, say, the temperature at that point in space. So that will take a point in space and give me a number. So this is a path I'm going to traverse. And my g of x, y, z is, and I'll just use the one that I did 2xy plus yz. Two x y plus y z. I can't remember long enough to walk across the room. Oh no, that's the gradient. I'm sorry. Uh, x squared y plus x y z. So that's my function. And so the composition. First I do f, and then I plug those x, y's, and z's into g. This gives me a function just of t, right? This will give me t squared times t squared, so that will be a t to the fourth. And here I get t times t squared times t cubed should be t to the sixth. This is a very simple composition, much more simple than either of the input functions. I can easily compute, let's call this h, h prime of t is quite easily seen to be 4t cubed plus So it's easy to see that it's 4t cubed plus 6t, 6t to the fifth. But let's compute it another way. Let's try and compute this by a, a chain rule kind of thing. So usually, I mean, we the chain rule would say that we want to take the derivative of the outside function here, which is g, and evaluate it at the inside function, and then multiply that times so the usual chain rule, if I have, uh, I have too many letters here, if I have um, a function r of s of t, and I want to take d dt of that, then that'll be r prime evaluated at s of t times s prime of t. So that's for a function of one variable. Here in a function of more than one variable, we want to compute something similar which is going to be, well, the only kind of derivative that we have for a function g here from r3 to r is the gradient. So we might try to take the gradient of g 
and evaluate it at f of t, and then multiply it by the derivative of f of t, well, f of t here is a vector valued function, so its derivative will be, I guess we used f prime of t for the notation of that, which is going to be a vector. And the only way that we can Yeah, so that's what we're going to do. So, uh, let me just turn the page here. Um, so we have, let's just calculate this somewhere. There we go. Yeah. So here we have the gradient of G is going to be the vector. So G is X squared Y plus X, Y, Z. So the gradient of G we take the derivative with respect to x, we get 2xy plus yz for the x derivative. Now we take the y derivative, we get x squared plus xz. And now we take the z derivative, that's 0, and that gives us xy. And if we evaluate the gradient of g at f of t, which means we plug in x equals t, y equals t squared, z equals t cubed, that'll give us the vector. So x equals t, y equals t squared, so that'll be 2t cubed plus t squared times t cubed, t to the fifth. Here for x is t, so that's t squared, and then xz will be t to the fourth, and then xy is t cubed. So that's the gradient of g evaluated at f of t, and f prime of t is the vector um, 1, 2t, 3t squared. And the only way that we know how to combine these two vectors to get a number out would be a dot product. So we take the dot product here. dot that with f prime of t, and let's see what we get. Well, we get 2t cubed plus t to the fifth, that's from this component here, plus 2t cubed plus 2t to the fifth from here, and then 3t to the fifth here. And then if we add everything up, so that is uh, 2 plus 2 is 4t cubed. And then on the t to the fifth, I have 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is, in fact, 6t to the fifth, which is what we wanted. This is h prime of t. So that worked. Now, so that should be a general principle that we want to do. So let's, let's check. Well, it's not really check, but let's uh, confirm this. So, so let's write that as a theorem. So suppose that I have my function g, which takes rn into r, and I have, and this needs to be continuously differentiable on on some domain. So I have some open domain that G is defined on, and I also have F, which takes R into Rn, which is continuous, well, actually it needs to be differentiable, differentiable on some interval AB. So that's just to make sure that where we're looking everything is nice. And we have, and it also has to satisfy that the image of where we're looking lands in this U. So f of t is in U for t in my interval where things are nice. So, okay, so everything's just nice now. And now let's let h of t be the composition, g of f of t. Um, 
then h of t is differentiable h of t is differentiable on the interval in question with h prime of t equal just what it was in the example the gradient of g evaluated at the image of f dotted with the derivative the vector derivative of f so that's my theorem and uh, so let's Ha, you can hear me. Uh, so let's, I, we already saw it in an example. Let's see how the proof works. So the proof just works by writing down, writing down how stuff goes. So the proof says that h prime of t, well, that's just the definition, the limit as h, oh, I shouldn't have used h, okay. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to change all of my H's to capital H's. I made the same mistake when I did it in class. That's okay. So there's my capital H. H prime of T is the limit as my difference goes to zero. So that's just the standard difference quotient for the derivative, which is the same thing. Just let's now forget about H and write it in terms of F and G. This is the limit as h goes to 0 of g of f of t plus my little offset minus g of f of t. And I divide it by the distance I am away. So if it exists. If it doesn't exist, well, then that's not the derivative. So now we look at that and let's let, just for notation, um, I want to call this guy here some point y. So this is a vector in Rn, and that'll be f of t plus h, and I'm just going to call him y for a minute. He really depends on h, but okay. And let's let f of t, and let's let x be f of t. So I just have these two vectors x and y so here's this is a this is in r n or r3 here's f of t which i'm calling x and here's y which is f of t plus h just a little bit off and here's my un my u where everything's nice they both are in there because that was the point and so now, if I consider the segment between them, then uh, I can use the mean value theorem on this. So I use the mean value theorem, which we talked about before. So I use the mean value theorem here to see that, so Everything's inside the domain where f is nice, everything's nice in here, it's continuously differentiable on there. So the mean value theorem says that somewhere between here and here that, um, that g of y minus g of x, the difference here divided by the distance that they're between, that the distance, this is y minus x, let's write it as y minus x, that this is exactly equal to, uh, this is wrong, sorry, g of y minus g of x is exactly equal to the gradient of g evaluated at this point x, no, some point nearby, x naught, which is maybe here, some point in the middle, dotted with the vector from y to x. Okay, so now we can um, write the same thing. Let's just divide both sides by h for the heck of it. So 
g of y minus g of x divided by h is the same thing as the gradient of g at this point x naught dotted with y minus x divided by h. I just divided both sides of the equation by h. That's okay. We can do that. All right. And so now we're almost there. So here, now let's just take the limit of both sides and let's rewrite it a little bit. Well, this is certainly, since this is true, then the limit as h goes to zero. Well, first let's write it back in terms of h. g of f of t plus h minus g of f of t, because that's what x is, divided by h, is the same thing as the gradient of g at some point x naught dotted with f of t plus h minus f of t over h. So that's what we have. And now we can just take the limit of both sides as h goes to zero of all of this stuff. This equals the limit as h goes to zero of this thing. Okay, so this t plus h here minus g of f of t over h, this limit is the derivative of h. If it exists here, and again if it exists, this limit, well, the, we can break it up into two pieces. The limit as h goes to zero of the gradient of g at x naught times the limit as h goes to zero of f of t plus h minus f of t. Well this is, since f is differentiable, this is just f prime of t. And here, well, since in our picture before, x and y, our point x naught lived on the line between f of t and f of t plus h, and h is going to zero, and since f is continuous, as well as derivative differentiable, but since it's continuous, this is going to shrink to zero, so that means this point x naught will converge to the point f of t. So that'll be just the gradient of g of f of t, which is a vector. So there we have it. The derivative is just what it was in the example. So that gives us the chain rule uh, for this pretty much useless situation. Well, it's not quite useless. It gives us the chain rule for this situation where we have some function h of t which is a composition of a function from bah, where we have a function taking r into rn followed by a function taking rn back down to r. So in this simple case we have um, we have that that the derivative works the chain rule is what we suspect it would be, which is the derivative of the outside function evaluated at the inside times, times in this case is interpreted as a dot product, the derivative on the inside function. Um, so we can use that to see that um, We can use that to see that if we have a function, actually, I think I didn't do this in class, so I'm going to do this on Wednesday, so this is a good place to stop. So I'll stop there. And uh, so the two things that I will do on Wednesday, which is, well, in the next class, is that I will 
do this in more generality and I will also prove that um, the, the gradient vector is perpendicular to a level set and so that is if I have some function f from Rn to R, it has level sets which are contours. So, or if I, well, okay, it has a, a contour here, and that the gradient vector is always perpendicular to the contours. It always, since, and, and, and this is intuitively quite clear because the contours are the directions in which the function doesn't increase at all, and if the function is nice, then the gradient, which is pointing in the direction of maximal increase, will be, of course, getting away from the contours as quickly as you can, that is, moving perpendicular to the tangent of the contour. So that's a good place to stop, because that's where I stopped last time, so I'll do that.